Hey guys, so the Apple event just finished a little bit ago. Thought I'd give some quick thoughts. Uh, so let's like jump right in. So right off the bat, uh, they announced the MacBook Air 15. A lot of people have been expecting this for a while. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, it's basically just your standard MacBook Air, um, except for it's 15 inches. Has headphone jack on one side and uh, the two USB-C Thunderbolt ports on the other side. Um, there are four colorways. Um, so, yeah, it's got the Mag MagSafe power. And so, uh, let's take a look at the specs real fast. All right. So here we are. We're going to look at the page. Uh, choose your MacBook Air, 15-inch. Starting at $12.99, uh, you got Midnight, Starlight, Space Gray, and Silver. So you got your 8-core CPU, 10-core GPU, 8 gigabytes of unified memory, 256 gig SSD storage. Uh, problem I see with this right off the bat is that Apple, uh, with their storage, with these 256 gig SSDs, has, uh, it's been way slower and so you almost always have to just automatically if you don't want to lose that speed you got to jump up to the next version which right here um only difference between these two models is the 512 gig ssd which um really seems almost like a must-have because the ssd on the 256 are really slow other than that that's the only difference in either of these if you click on here uh you literally see there's no CPU, GPU choice, anything. The only differences are your memory and your storage or your power adapter. Uh, so it looks like you're going to, by default, get the 35 compact. Um, doesn't look like they are charging any upgrade to get the 70 watt, which is interesting. So I guess that's something. So uh, let's jump back in. Right, so next up, they announced uh, upgrades for the Mac Studio. Uh, there was no update for the Mac Mini. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the differences in a second. Uh, they announced two new upgraded M2 chips for the Mac Studio. Uh, it starts again at 1999 just like the other one, so uh, the previous model, so 2000, yet again, uh, I believe the pro version of the Mac Mini is 12 or 1300, we'll look at that again in a second, um, so yeah, chassis seems to be the same, the ports on the front, SD card slot on the front, uh, and so let's... Uh, Let's take a look at it real fast on the purchase page right so here we are on our purchase page um, Mac Studio so the default system comes with M2 Max 12 core CPU 30 core GPU 16 core neural engine 32 gigs unified memory 512 gig SSD then has the two USB-C ports, the one SDXC card slot on the front, and on the back we got four Thunderbolt, two USB-A, one HDMI, one 10 gig network, and a headphone jack. All right, so you might ask, how does this compare to the Mac Mini? A lot of people have been jumping in and buying the uh, M2 Pro version. So here's the M2 Pro version. You can see M2 Pro has 10 core CPU and 16 core GPU. The neural engine is the same. It's 1299. This comes with 16 gigs memory, 512 gig SSD, and gigabit Ethernet. You don't get the SD card slot or the two front USB C ports. Uh, otherwise, the back is basically the same, other than you got gigabit. Now the problem I see here is like if you had any inclination to upgrade uh, <clears throat> the M Pro Mac Mini is that 
one, you could upgrade the processor and you're still going to be less powerful than the M2 Max. Uh, you're going to jump up to 12 core, but that GPU, you can see you got 30 core GPU and for 200, you go to 38. Yeah, the Ultra is way up there, $2,400 extra. But if you start doing any of these add-ons, this is where it gets interesting because you add 32 gigs of memory from the 16, and now you're at 1699, so that's to match. And then if you need to, uh, if you want the gigabit, you're at 1800. And so uh, to me, there's no longer any reason at all, really, unless you're just gonna stick base config, um, or maybe just want the gigabit ethernet, but it's like if you want any more power at all, um, then they've kind of basically supplanted this. And this is kind of the problem with the way they go back and forth with their systems, is that you end up where uh, they upgrade one, not the other, and it kind of goes every other year or at the end of the year. And so right now, uh, to me, the M2 Pro goes from being kind of like the value machine to uh, you might as well just upgrade to the studio at this point if you need the extra power. If you're fine with the base version, I think the value is still there, but if, if you need even the extra memory uh, or want to upgrade to the 10 gig uh, Ethernet, then it's like, why not just spend an extra 200 bucks and get get the studio. I think that would be the only thing that makes sense for that model. Okay, so up next we got the announcement of the MacBook Pro. You can see them putting it together here. Uh, pretty interesting. Um, want to talk about some of the I.O. on this in a second because they didn't really address it. They announced the M2 Ultra along with this. Um, it's their new highest end chip, uh, and they announced a price for the Mac Pro at uh, $7,000 to start. Um, they kind of showed that they're three times faster than uh, Intel Mac Pro. My problem that they've been doing with this whole event, and I think events in the past, is that they keep comparing to, you know, uh, the, the fastest Intel MacBook Air. Well, MacBook Air on Intel was never good. The only reason you bought them was for people who just did office work, uh, where now you can buy a MacBook Air and you can video edit. So, um, yeah, it's a big leap, but they went from selling a lot of these to different markets, and so I don't think it's exactly fair to talk about it. Anyway, back in, uh, six PC, or I think seven, actually, total PCI Express slots. Uh, we'll look at this in a second. Um, up to 192 gigabyte unified memory. Uh, IO's pretty basic in the back. Other than the Thunderbolt, you got two HDMI and two USB-A headphone, and then the rest are Thunderbolt. Pretty interesting that there's not even a display port. As you can see here, we got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, we'll talk about that in a second because they outlined a little bit more, but still not everything on their product page. Uh, there's a rack mount option. Also cover that in a second. Um, so there's your specs. Um, six open PCI Gen 4 slots. There are some exceptions, and again, we'll go over that in a second. So uh, let's just jump over to the product page and take a look at the options. So here we are on the new Mac Pro page. Uh, we can see that there are just two versions here to configure, and this is because one's the tower and a $69.99, and we can see that the rack mounted version actually has a $500 Apple tax on it, making it $74.99. So if we configure this here, you can see that the base model has 24 cores, 
CPU and 60 core GPU, 32 core neural engine. And then to get that maxed out 24 core CPU, 76 core GPU is another $1,000. Uh, the base model comes with 64 gigs of unified memory, $800 more to upgrade to 128 and $1,600 total to upgrade to 192. Get a base of one terabyte SSD storage. Uh, jumping up to two terabytes is $400. $1,000 to do a four terabyte and eight terabytes is $2,200. You can also see that we get the frame without feet and it's $400 if you want wills, uh, which is definitely another Apple tax there. does come with a magic mouse. If you want to switch that out for a trackpad, it's $50. If you want the magic mouse and the trackpad, it's going to add another $150. It does come with a magic keyboard with Touch ID and a keypad. And so that's it. You can easily go over $10,000 with this build. Um, well, let's take a look at the Mac Pro page real fast and get a better look at some of these internals. So they advertise six PCI Express uh, slots, but here it's listing one more, um, which is interesting. So let's take a look at these real fast. These bottom two are double height, uh, PCI Express 16 Gen 4, so there's two of those. And then we have uh, two single height and two double height for, for a total of four um, PCI Express 8X, so that's half speed Gen 4. So you can see these are the single height ones and then double height here. And then uh, this wasn't mentioned in their briefing but this is the an io card um so i'm wondering if you'll actually be able to change this out because i believe uh these are both io cards i believe and i'm not sure they both look replaceable but they're only showing this one is but if you look at the top of the computer um this top one would be where all those thunderbolt ports are and then this one would be where those two hdmi ports are so let's see if, yeah, so right here, you can see, so this looks like this top card, which we have six Thunderbolt, and then this other card would be uh, two HDMI, two USB-A, and the headphone jack. And the two, uh, Ethernet ports are on the power supply, which is kind of interesting. So it makes me wonder if they're doing kind of like an internal design of what they used on the iMac where they had the power supply had the Ethernet jack in it. Um, kind of wonder if that's some sort of take on that. Uh, the interesting thing to me here is that this looks like some sort of possibly PCI connector for power. See two, four, six, eight, twelve. So a twelve pin connector here that looks like that's possibly PCI power. And then these are two what appear to be SATA ports. Um, and then that looks like a USB A port. And so that is really interesting to me because I didn't hear anything mentioned at all about this. And so it does make me wonder if, especially because there is no mounting brackets or anything, unless they do something to use an IO card to mount uh, a card or something for that. Um, so that looks like there could be, you know, some sort of SATA expansion with SSDs possibly, and you grab your power off this connector. Um, an internal USB-A, I'm not sure, maybe that's just also for power or another expansion card slot. I don't recall them talking about that. I missed part of the event though, so, and I haven't scrubbed through all of it, but thought this, this was actually the most interesting thing in here to me because I don't remember them talking about it. 
They did go briefly over the new Mac OS, which is Sonoma. Um, it's kind of funny because the screensaver right here, uh, Microsoft already took a pot shot at Apple for this, saying it's a rip off of the Windows XP background, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, they added widgets, which is interesting because I think Windows, I believe, has had widgets since Windows 7. Um, they did add this feature for overlay with a like a presenter thing so that you stay in front of your stuff, uh, your content, and that what they say is going to integrate into Teams and other software, and that will be built in. Um, you can kind of do that sort of on some software anyway, so it's not a new concept, but will probably make it easier for Apple users that are just using Teams. Um, they had a gaming thing. Let's see if I can find that. This was a two hour long event, so I don't plan on covering everything they talked about because I don't care about some of the watch stuff and some of the other stuff they talked about. So. Anyway, um, they're adding a game mode, uh, and so they didn't talk crazy ton amounts about it, but uh, that Hideo Kojima, and uh, it's interesting, it's not on the page, and he's bringing Death Rising um, to Mac. Um, I don't know how they're doing this exactly. Um, we've never had anything uh, to successfully really run games on Mac OS. Uh, I think they are releasing Metal 3 with Sonoma. Um, with Linux and stuff, you have you know Proton that converts DirectX and Vulkan and stuff. Or basically it takes DirectX and it makes turns it into Vulkan, I think, is what it does. And that's how you get like all these Steam games, like with the Steam Deck and stuff on Linux. Um, they're showing Stray off right here, I believe. The interesting thing I think about gaming on Mac OS is one of the problems that kind of I think killed the idea of Proton and different things on Mac OS was that they completely killed off Windows or not Windows, but they killed off 32-bit support for, like, all apps, I believe. And so that created a problem um, for, like, all your back catalog of all the games from, you know, even a lot of the games from, you know, Windows 7, maybe 8 and 8.1. Uh, there were a lot of 32-bit games. Um, trying to remember when Windows switched to 64-bit. Um, anyway, so I could see that maybe if they do something kind of like a Proton on Mac OS that maybe they could make it, but that's just conjecture because I didn't see a lot of this part. Um, but if they did something like Proton, yeah, they could be, they could bring games to Mac, but they would only be modern games, which I guess a lot of people, that's all they care about, but uh, if you wanted like play your back Steam catalog, you know, that's probably not going to ever happen unless um, someone finds a way around some of those limitations because that's exactly why we don't have Proton. Um, so Apple ProVision, I could show the video, but they spent an hour on this. And so I don't plan on doing that. So this is kind of like a AR... Uh, they're calling it spatial computing. So like when someone walks into the room, you'll be able to see them. They'll be able to tell if you're watching a movie or whatever, it will show differently. Hasn't powered by M2. Um, the concept of this and some of the stuff, all the audio built in, um, unclear if the battery is built into the headset or if it's built into the cord and like you just take, power brick and connect it to USB-C or something to charge because like this was more of an announcement and considering how long they spent on it spent on it it's kind of surprising because like it's not available for pre-order I think they're just saying sometime next year um, 
And so the idea of it looks pretty cool with the audio and everything built in. Uh, you navigate with just your eyes, hands, and voice. Uh, if you want to learn a lot about this, I'd just, you know, look on a, a Mac website or, or you can always, you know, jump into the, you can jump into and watch the keynote online or on Apple's page. I haven't actually clicked on this prior to this. So yeah, there's cameras and sensors underneath. So audio straps, the headband. My problem with this dual eye thing is like I've tried mixed reality and VR and like this separation for me is always created like it's always been very apparent with my eyes and like I don't know if that's just uh just me or not but it's always like created an issue where like I feel like I'm looking through two separate objects one on each eye and doesn't feel like I'm just looking through a pair of glasses and uh it's always made it so I don't really feel like that immersed in that. And so like, I don't know, maybe they're, you know, doing something better to seal your eyes or something, but the type of things never worked for me. So yeah, it has a built-in M2. So basically they're touting this as like, this is, you know, this is a computer, um, this is a Mac, but you're controlling it with your hands and eyes and your speech. Um, they showed off a few apps, um, showed off watching movies and whatnot. And you can also record movies with it and then watch them. And they advertised like that recording them that way. And then being able to watch them again, the same way, basically by putting it back in front of you makes you feel just like you're there. Um, Let's see. Yeah, they advertise it's running its first spatial operating system. Sorry, I was scrolling through all this really fast, but uh, I kind of see a tech breakdown of this. And I understand like there's a lot of R&D involved here. Um, more pixels than a 4K TV. Has a brand new R1 chip that is specifically dedicated to process input from the camera sensors and microphone streaming images to the displays within 12 milliseconds for a virtually lag free real time view of the world. You can see here it runs Vision OS. They're touting their privacy, of course, which they always tout, even though they've been breached a few times. Anyway, what this page doesn't show is that the announced price is $3,500. Um, some sites had heard before this even was announced, like it had leaked and we were hearing 3000 A lot of people were saying that was a lot. I tuned into the end of uh, Luke Milani from YouTube and uh, he seems really sold on this. So we'll look back at this as the... Uh, as just like the launch of the first iPhone um, and that he thinks the price is justified. I completely disagree. Um, one, um, like when the iPhone came out, it was, you know, really revolutionary, even though we didn't have the app store and stuff and whatnot. But like, uh, one, it wasn't $3,500. I don't even think with inflation, it was close to $3,500. Uh, and second, like, everyone has, uh, like, at least in America, like, and I think even, like, in Asia and different places, like, having a phone became a big deal. It, 
is required for work. Like you have to be able to be connected with, uh, I don't think we're going to see people walking around town with vision pro glasses on. Um, you know, I think that the ecosystem of this is going to be, a, you know, is going to be about as good as, uh, it's only going to be as good as the, the people that buy it. And so like, I guess the question is going to be, uh, like how big will the user base be? Because if the user base is really small, then I don't really see them, uh, like developers aren't going to invest in a small ecosystem. And so, like, unless there are certain apps and stuff that they can just move over from iPhone or iPad uh, or whatever, like, I don't see them investing in this unless the user base becomes fairly decent. Um, I, I think the size of the user base is going to be tied directly to... Uh, I think it will be directly tied to, like, the development community because I think... Developers are going to see, you know, what the interest is, how many people buy in, and thirty five hundred dollars to uh, to get into a new marketplace seems like a lot of money to me. Um, I mean, I can buy a lot of cool stuff for thirty five hundred dollars. Yeah, I know it's a whole computer and whatnot, but like. The problem is, is with like watching movies and stuff, it's like all of this is like all by yourself. It still separates you. And like they tried to advertise like that, hey, like you'll be able to, you know, that you'll be able to see, you know, the people that walk in and whatnot. But it's like, yeah, that's fine. But like, you're not going to be talking to somebody and uh, watching a movie. So, uh, I don't know. It like still seems like it's still going to be something that you're only going to use alone. So, like, you know, if you're with a spouse or have friends over, like, it's not like you're all going to each have your own pair of vision glasses and watch the same thing. They never even talked about, like, if there's interconnectability. Probably because he was going to drop, like, seven grand for two pairs, you know? So, um, seems, seems a bit expensive. Uh, like I said, Apple also talked about software updates to Apple, uh, TV, which they talked about using, uh, FaceTime using your phone. They had a holder for the iPhone up close to the screen under your TV. And uh, your iPhone was connected so you could, you know, use FaceTime and then use your TV as the screen with your Apple TV for the person you're viewing. Um, and some other updates. They updated watchOS. They... Uh, Talked about iPad OS 17, I believe. Um, none of the other stuff was that crazy. I think this is Vision's going to be what most people are talking about. Um, let me know what you guys think. Uh, if you think this is a good idea, if you think the pricing does kind of seem like the Apple tax, like Apple seemed like they tried to kind of. Uh, be affordable and then like the first gen mac mini and macbook air were so good that then they released the m2 versions and they actually kind of uh they actually made the memory worse so they'd be slower unless you spent extra money to upgrade so it seems like apple uh isn't comfortable being in the cheap pr pricing area and they're trying to get you to uh upgrade unless you really don't care. Um, and I guess they're sad, they're okay selling that, but it does seem like they're trying to kind of, uh, replace themselves as that more premier, like 
we think we're better than everyone price area. So um doesn't seem to me like they've been making as many. I saw an article the other day about how even like one of the Acer laptops was way cheaper than uh, the M2 MacBook Air, but uh, it was faster. And the only thing that was worse was it had like an hour and a half worse battery life. But to me, that's not even that big of a deal. So, um, cause like we're getting to the point where we're like, you know, at 12 to 18 hours on laptop, there's like not really a con set of circumstances where I'm going to be on a laptop that long without probably spending time to, uh, to recharge it. So anyway, let me know your thoughts and comments, um, your opinions, uh, I guess whatever, or even if there's something you'd like to see covered, uh, I'm a nerd in general, so I just like, I like technology and games and everything, and so uh, it all interests me to some degree. So anyway, uh, please like and subscribe. Uh, thank you to all of you out there that so far that have subscribed. I appreciate it greatly. You guys are awesome, and uh, I will see you guys in the next video.